Okay, so for this next module, we're gonna be talking about how to investigate the person with a suspected small bowel obstruction. As I mentioned in the previous module, it's important to understand that bowel obstruction is really a clinical diagnosis. It's that key feature of obstipation, the failure to both pass gas and stool for a period of time, again, probably around 12 to 24 hours, which really is what makes the diagnosis of a bowel obstruction. Again, if they're passing a bit of gas and a bit of stool, really at that point, they're not by definition a bowel obstruction. But you do need to have some investigation to help you determine which patients are sick and really to help confirm both the cause of the bowel obstruction and whether that history aligns with what, with what is what actually is happening. So one of the most common investigations that will be ordered is this three views of the abdomen. People will order them for any abdominal pain complaint. You might you order them on the ward or the emergency department, but it's important to understand what really are the three views and what information you're getting from them. And I would suggest that this is the first test that you should be ordering when you're considering a patient who has a bowel obstruction. The first view is the upright abdomen. The upper abdomen is very useful because it shows us those air fluid levels that are a very classic feature of a bowel obstruction. Now, air fluid levels can be present in both mechanical and functional bowel obstructions. So even uh, gastroenteritis or an ileus from a medical cause can cause these air fluid levels to be present. But they are a very common feature and are expected to be found when you're looking at a patient with a small bowel obstruction. Typically we say greater than three air fluid levels is clinically significant, but I wouldn't get caught up on those numbers. Just notice that they have multiple air fluid levels and they're in groups, like you can see this group here are pretty parallel. We have this group here parallel, a few parallel groups here. That's very consistent with a bowel that's not moving fluid through anymore and uh, is very consistent with that diagnosis of a bowel obstruction. The next image is the supine abdomen. And really what it's telling us is mostly bowel distension. So here you can actually see how large the small bowel is and you'll see large gas filled small bowel right up in the uh, midline when you're dealing with a bowel obstruction. The final x-ray in three views of the abdomen is the upright chest x-ray. The upright chest x-ray will give you some clues because the abdomen is included, you'll see some signs of distended small bowel, possibly air fluid levels. But the real purpose is twofold. One, to look for free air under the diaphragm, which is probably the most important thing we want to find on this upright chest x-ray. But also we need to consider that chest pathology could be a cause of someone's abdominal pain complaint. And so the chest x-ray helps us there. When you're thinking about an x-ray and trying to determine whether the bowel is distended, which would be associated with a bowel obstruction, we wanna use this three, six, and nine rule. The three centimeter small bowel limit really represents 50% more than the upper limit of normal for a small bowel. So a small bowel is typically two centimeters in diameter. If we see that it's three centimeters, that's 50% above the normal for a small bowel, and that's considered dilated. Same thing with a large intestine. So if the colon has a uh, upper limit normal of four centimeters, then six centimeters on the x-ray is considered distended. And finally, the cecum, again, the upper limit of normal is typically six centimeters. So if we see nine centimeters on the x-ray, that's considered dilated. And certainly a nine centimeter cecum is something that would be a red flag or concern for future possible perforation. And we wanna have that in the back of our mind if we're seeing that, that we would wanna manage that uh, very carefully. In addition to the x-rays, blood work is very useful. And to help you kind of think about what tests you wanna order or other uh, information you wanna get about a patient with a small bowel obstruction, it's useful to use this fatal acronym. That's fever, acidosis, tachycardia, abdominal pain, and leukocytosis. So specifically the acidosis, we're gonna to wanna to have a lactate on our blood work and for the abdominal pain, just recognize that we're really talking about peritonitis here because the typical patient with small bowel obstruction will have some abdominal pain complaints. And so that's not abnormal or concerning, but if they have peritonitis, rebound tenderness, percussion tenderness, those features, that's considered concerning in the setting of a small bowel obstruction.
And we want to look at the white cell count because if it's elevated, then that's a serious concern in someone who has a small bowel obstruction. I would also say some additional tests like creatinine would be useful because you do want to make sure they're not acute renal failure. Your bowel obstruction itself is going to potentially cause volume loss and depletion, and that's going to be evidence in our tachycardia part of fatal. So I'd even include things like creatinine in that T for tachycardia. It's a volume status assessment. Do they have signs of acute renal failure? Something to add in on your, on your order if you're considering someone with a small bowel obstruction. Now, again, I've talked about these categories on the previous lecture of large bowel versus small bowel and how those are very important for us to differentiate the management plan. So it is useful to differentiate on x-ray between large bowel and small bowel, and we're going to go over that now. So typically on the x-ray, small bowel, we'll see centrally located dilated loops of small bowel. We'll have multiple air fluid levels and we'll have a paucity of clonic gas. But when we're looking at the large bowel and we have a large bowel obstruction, Typically, we're having peripherally located, distended large bowel. There's going to be far fewer air fluid levels because the small bowel is still usually able to dump its contents into the uh, large bowel. And then there's a paucity of gas in the, in the, uh, in the uh, small uh, bowel, again, because it's still typically able to dump that fluid into the uh, colon despite the obstruction. So uh, again, here's an example. So on the left, we have a sign of a large bowel obstruction here. We have distended uh, sigmoid colon here, and we have a few key features. You can see they're more peripherally located gas, but also notice we're seeing hostra here on the x-ray. These are lines that don't go completely across. Compare that to the small bowel obstruction here. Again, we have more centrally located gas. You see the loops are, are spinning through the center here, uh, in a more dense pattern. We have these uh, lines that go all the way across the small bowel. These are the valvulae conaventae or the plicae circularis that we're seeing on the small bowel uh, x-ray. Also note that there really isn't much in the way of air fluid levels or um, small bowel gas on the large bowel obstruction. Same here on the small bowel obstruction. We actually have a paucity of large bowel gas, again, consistent with the small bowel obstruction. Last thing, just so you know that there's a contrast in the bladder here. This patient probably had a CT scan at some point, and we're just seeing excretion of the IV contrast in the bladder. That's not a significant finding on this x-ray. So next, we're going to move on to management of bowel obstructions.